4.6 billion year old meteorite. This, this meteorite is actually uh, older than Earth itself. Hello everyone. Uh, today I have the pleasure to have with me a really good friend of mine, David Aaron Carpenter. And he's not only a great violinist and violist, but he also has a family business, which is fascinating. Among other things, he deals with beautiful instruments such as Stradivari and other great things. And I'm going to ask him a few things that I hope is interesting for you guys. He recently just launched a YouTube channel with really interesting content, so please go check it out. Hey David, how are you, man? Hey Pablo, thanks so much. That was a great introduction. Honored to be here. <laughs> Man, I loved this video that you just made about talking about instruments and that really made me, you know, this question that everyone has, like, is it worth it? Of course, a Stradivari is so expensive. Why just not go modern? And of course, there are so many great modern instruments. I, I know you you also are a big defender of, of modern instruments, right? But what do you think makes a Strad so special? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I believe Stradivarius was really the pioneer of a new model of, a, of an instrument, right? And, and if you think of like in history of all the people who really transformed something really big, I think Stradivarius will be up there with Michelangelo and da Vinci and all the great um, Renaissance painters and the artists and the sculptors. And when we look back, we just say, wow, a man who was leaving over 300 years ago uh, created this new way of approaching an instrument and it was so fresh it was so new and I think that's what people really gravitate towards it's like you know when you see a great da Vinci painting and you really say how is he so ahead of his time you know these these are the greatest Renaissance thinkers right and, and basically Stride was a little bit later but um, you know he had kind of the same um, kind of approach to to inventing something new and I think that's what makes him so special um, but, you know, I think as musicians, it's, it's an honor and privilege just to be around these instruments, let alone make music on them. So, you know, I, I think you have a phenomenal cello as well that you probably enjoy playing on every day. Very much. Um, uh, well, I, 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 many people who see this channel know that I played a, a Stradivari from 1696 that belongs to the Nippon Music Foundation. Uh, it happened to be the first uh, Stradivari that I ever played and it took me a, a long time to get used to it. Uh, at least, I think, for sure to make it completely my sound, three years. I think th at least this is a really, really complex, complex instrument. But how is it with you? Uh, how, how many strats did you play already or go went through your hands? Yeah, many, many for sure. But, um, you know, I think we started a, at a very young age and my brother, Sean, is one of the, the top experts of Stradivarius in the world. And as a kid, when he was 10, 11 years old, he would literally be studying these Stradivari books for, you know, he wouldn't put them down. So he would read the book and reread it and yeah. keep on reading it. Um, so every time we went to, uh, to visit a dealer or an auction house, um, he would always say, oh, that's this one, that's this one, and you know, that's from 1694, this Strad is... So he was really passionate about it, and I think it was really that love um, that inspired me, because he's five years older than me, and then my sister um, is a year older than me, and kind of having them play music and play the violin, and then always, you know, looking at what they were doing, and I would always want to, you know, run into their, um, their room when they were practicing and just show them what I'm, I'm doing. Um, I think that love of, of music and also about instruments is what really, you know, had us going into this, this new motion. Um, so I think it's, you know, again, I mean, it, for, for me, we've pl probably played over 50, 60, 70 Stradivari violins, and, and it's always great to, to study them as well. Um, and just see them and, and go to museums and sometimes take them out of the cases and play them on, in concerts, special concerts. And, and for me, it just, you know, it really is kind of the, the absolute best passion. But like you said, I mean, it takes many years to really understand and, and, and really feel a new instrument. Um, if you think about it, when you first go drive a car, you're not going to drive a LaFerrari, right? You're not going to go drive a Lamborghini the first time <laughs> that you're, 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 you're going out and when you're 16 years old and, you know, your, your parents will give you the keys. You can't just go take a super, super car. I think the same thing applies with, with instruments like Stradivarius. First, you have to 
have those 10,000 hours and then much more, uh, practice four to five hours a, you know, a, a day, and then get up to that level that you're really comfortable about really understanding what this instrument is and how many colors it could really bring out. And I think you know, it's hard for people sometimes to understand that, but it is a good analogy to make with with cars and you know and, and something that would take many many hours to get to that level to really appreciate something and, and I'm sure you you understand that as well definitely and also even for a very experiment uh, experimented player I think it would take time as well as a driver if uh, Hamilton gets the new F1 it won't take him it would not take him a few seconds just to learn what the machine can do um, I think same with us uh, One of the things that we were talking the other day, you and me, is about this test that happened. Yeah, it was, it was a very interesting test. I think it, it took place around 2011, 2012 um, in France, where about 21 performers played on about six strads and six modern instruments. And they had a blind test and you know, they were all blindfolded and everything. It was actually a kind of funny video, um, but I kind of laughed at it a little bit. I mean, it, it's, I understand where they're going. But the, the funniest part, the, the one main issue that, that they did not say is that every violin that they were comparing the strats to were basically copies of Stradivarius, right? So I think, you know, there's a distinction between being a modern maker and then inventing something new. If you, let's say you had a, a scientific test which would require more than, let's say, a hundred Stradivarius compared to a hundred modern instruments, um, I think if you said, okay, I'm going to have all the modern makers invent something new and then compare it to Stradivarius. That's another kind of scientific test. But if you're, you know, if you know, if I put a Monet, a copy of a Monet next to a real Monet, and I said, Pablo, which one do you like better? And you picked out either the Monet or the, you know, the, the fake one. If you pick picked out the the copy of it, I would say, oh, I got you. Therefore, the fake Monets are better than than the real Monets, and you don't need to spend millions of dollars, right? So it's kind of a Uh, disingenuous kind of uh, you know uh, uh, it's, it's, it's I understand what the test was for but I, I find it's a little bit you know humorous because the, don't get me wrong I love modern instruments I think you know there's one maker um, in particular I, I brought like I think five uh, violins recently by Luis Amarim and he's a maker from Brazil and now he's he's living in Cremona with his, his amazing family And I just think he's one of the most talented makers of today. And it's not, I don't have a, uh, I'm not sponsored by him. I'm not, you know, I don't get discounts or maybe a little bit discounts sometimes, um, but nothing, nothing major <laughs> on, you know, on, on what we're doing. And I'm saying, I love these instruments. I, I get to travel with them. I don't need to worry about customs in all those, you know, different, different worlds. Uh, but at the same time, we always go back to the, the great Stradivarius and Del Jesus in our collection and say, Wow, I mean, there's really nothing like this, and and it just really honoring kind of the legacy that Stradivarius made and Del Gesù, and how many millions and millions of copies were of these these men who pioneered something new and basically revolutionized the entire violin world. Because before Stradivarius, there was Amadi and Andrea Amadi, um, and you know all these other makers that the the violins were good, but they were not anything near kind of the the unbelievable models of the Stradivarius and for cellos and and Stradivarius was always you know he's tweaking his models right sometimes you had the long pattern you had the golden period you had you know the late period and every model is different different varnish different wood selection different scrolls and and all these things that are just so beautiful to, to see and, and actually and really take in and and I think for so many modern makers they look at Stradivarius and say wow I, I want to try something like this I want to try this model today and I think that's the beautiful thing about having some of those masterpieces of the past that the modern makers are learning from and 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 really getting um, you know inspired by but the two violins that were not in that test were you know Itzhak Kroman's The Swall or like you know Pingo Zuckerman's uh, The Dushkin because those violins would would destroy any violin I don't care what it is <laughs> so yeah When I heard about that test, I was also a bit, um, not suspicious, but you know, it, I think it depends a lot on, do you know who played it? Who, who made the test? They said, were they like top level players or because you need to, I mean, if you give that violin to Janine Janssen or, you know, or some Antrophy Mutter, like some great soloist who is used to play these instruments for these people, I think it's very easy to see 
even even I'm not taking anything away from modern instruments. I, I played modern instruments that sound absolutely incredible, but you can tell the age of the wood even in the sound of an instrument if you play for a top player like this. So I I found it very hard to believe um, when no one could tell. You know, I think the science the scientific test was deeply flawed, and and it just it just really funny because you saw the media just absolutely take it on and say, well, Stradivarius is no longer great, or you know, it just. But I I, I kind of like just look at that and, and kind of just scoff at it because you, you're basically just just trying to put down. It's like basically like saying Michelangelo is no longer relevant because there was a great bronze copy of one of his masterpieces. So you know it, it's. You know, I, I think I think it's kind of it's kind of, kind of humorous in that respect. But you know, at the end of the day, we're all looking at Stradivarius and all the modern makers of today are basically copying those models of Strads. I mean, you you look at the Messiah, you look at all of his different um, you know kind of models and how he he really revolutionized the instrument. And if you think about it, Pablo, um, I was I was wondering. Let's take the car example again, right? You're not going to compare a 1930s Bugatti with a Bugatti of today, right? Can you imagine both of them are, are, are going on the same path? Who, you know, which car is going to be faster, right? So, you know, as much as you could say a 1930s Bugatti is aesthetically more beautiful than um, the new Bugatti, or, you know, some people might say it's the opposite, um, you cannot say that the, the old Bugatti is going to outperform the new Bugatti, right? But... With Stradivarius and Del Jesus, it's probably the only time in history that something that is 300 years old is outperforming something with technology of today, you know, and, and there's no question about that, right? If you think about that, it's kind of a, a, a brilliant, uh, you know, kind of conclusion that, yeah. that, that something that was made over 350 years ago is outperforming an instrument that was made today, right? And it's just kind of mind-boggling to think of how genius these these men were back then for the physics of the acoustics of the instrument. And and for me, that's that's incredibly, you know, just just from the the, the physics point of view, or just you know, kind of the, just from the 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 uh, the uh, you know the brilliant side of it, it it's just mind-boggling. It really is. Yeah, that, when you put it like this, is absolutely insane. That's true. Do you think? I mean, I've, I've read so many things about maybe was the uh, how the trees were because of, you know, the weather conditions back then. Do you think it has to do with the wood or with the... It's only about talent of feeling, you know, sensibility with, with working with the wood or... Yeah, I mean, I, I back then, obviously, the Bosnian maple wood had time to breathe. You know, the wood was, was a lot uh, bigger, thicker, and then, you know, it, it all came through the... The waterways and you know it, it's really fascinating of, of how these men just kind of like looked at these big logs of wood and made such masterpieces from them and you know it, it is it, it's something about like the the varnish quality or you know the the, the new kind again I think the, the greatest thing about Antonio Stradivarius is that he was always trying to create something new he was always trying to look at different models he was always trying to think oh can I do this can I change this can I you know can I maybe change the acoustics or even where the, the sound post is going um, and I think that is where the curiosity is. And I think that's where we look at back at, at people like him, people like Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Michelangelo, Raphael, who were always thinking about something in a, in a, different, in a different way. And I think, um, you know, the, the more and more we kind of like look back, it's just, you know, these men were truly geniuses and, and, and were absolutely brilliant. But I mean, looking at kind of even the, the, the market of where Stradivarius have gone, because... Um, I understand the point of so many musicians who are kind of frustrated saying violins have kind of just, just been in, insanely, um, you know, uh, prized for, you know, the last, you know, decades and everything. And how is it possible that a musician could, you know, afford a four or five to, you know, over $40 million instrument? Um, and I, I, I get it. I, I think, but we also have to, to realize like where we are in, in, in kind of the, uh, in, in a different kind of world where, you know, people are buying $600 million yachts and spending uh, $10 million on gasoline every year. Um, you know, if you think about it, it's just kind of ridiculous, right? And, 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 and to say, well, can I have a treasure of the world that, you know, there are less than 600 examples that exist, right? How many cellos? Maybe 30 that are, are, are you know, uh, truly known. But, yeah. but, you know, kind of like that are played or, you know, out of, of the museum. 
and with the violins, less than 200 that are in private collections that could ever be either played or you know uh, loaned out. A lot of them are in museums. Um, you you just and violas, uh, I don't know, 11 or 12, uh, you know, debatable. Um, and and of those, maybe one or two could ever be made available for sale. So you really have to understand or, or just think. Wait a minute, you know, a, a, a guy is paying 20 million dollars on maintenance on his yacht every year, and if you think about it, we're like, wait a minute, in five years, that's a hundred million dollars. Um, so why shouldn't the strat start at four or five million dollars and really make the person who is buying it, you know, just making sure that that violin is taken care of and it's in the right hands? And I think that's kind of the David Fulton. Um, you know, the greatest collector in Seattle, that's what he was always saying is that I want to make my instruments expensive enough that the next you know, generation really takes care of it. And I, I understand that point. I mean, you know, looking at the collectibles world of, you know, Ming Dynasty vases going for $80 million and Picasso's going above $200 million and Cezanne's and, and all these things. And, and we were saying, why shouldn't basically a Leonardo da Vinci of the violin be these crazy, you know, prices today? And I, I, I get both sides, you know, of the of the equation, and it's it's also funny to, to say that you know once you put these instruments or a museum, I I think it applies more to art because there are more than um, in in the museum like the Metropolitan Museum, right? If you think about it, probably two percent or three percent of the entire collection is on view, right? So maybe over ninety five percent is is downstairs in the vaults and, and all these things, and and you're basically saying, wait a minute, you know, I thought if you put it in a museum, it's going to be you know experienced by the whole world, and that, it's actually not true. Um, it's it's actually the times that musicians are playing on it and going around the world and performing concerts like you are that people are actually you know experiencing these instruments. So I mean, there's there's a there's a give and take, especially uh, for the great museums around the world. Wow. Um, going back a little bit, you just mentioned that there's only 11 violas and you happen to play one of the one of them. How, how was that? Oh, it's, you know, it's one of the great experiences. You know, also in the uh, Musée uh, Cremona, uh, de Cremona um, I, I played on the, the Moscow State, um, had one of the violas on display, so got to take it out of the, the, the glass box and, and play with my brother and sister. We played a trio of all the strads and, you know, I think Pablo, the, the, the thing is, again, when we're looking at some of these these gems of the world, um, it really is an honor just to even be around it, let alone be able to play on it. And and I think um, for me, it's more of like looking at the history, looking at the provenance, who owned it, um, and and I think that that is kind of the, the most beautiful part of, about it as well, because a lot of kings and queens have been around these instruments. If you think about Mozart, how many strats he probably heard, or you know, if you think about um, you know the pieces that were written. How many times, uh, you know, because I think Bach was was writing his uh, Bach partitas and sonatas at the same time Stradivarius is basically in, you know, uh, the golden period. And, and it kind of is mind-boggling to think of of how how close connected all of these, you know, musicians and composers were. Um, and also to think of Beethoven would have heard a Strad or, you know, Mozart would have heard, um, you know, some of these, these great instruments as well. It just, it, it really puts history... And, and, and craftsmanship and, 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 and everything all together and, and music um, all in one. And, and I think that is, if you just really step back and you know, think of the, the Red Violin or you know, a couple of these other movies, how many people this, this instrument has, has been you know, through. And, and your cello right now is going through you on a, on a beautiful journey and you're, you're playing in the Hollywood Bowl in front of th tens of thousands of people and you're playing with Anso Fimuter. And, and I think that to me is, is amazing. I mean, you know, you, you have an, you're taking incredible care of, of the instrument and, and you get to share it with the world. And, and that's what we need. Yeah, that's something I, I think very often whenever I'm flying and I arrive to a new city, I wonder like how many times did my cello been in that city with, with who and who, like, yeah, when I play a concert or, or I play a sonata by Beethoven or Brahms and I'm like, wow, Maybe Brahms did hear this cello before played, but someone, you know, these, these kind of things are, are magic, as you said. Anyway, man, it's great to talk to you. Uh, uh, this is such a fascinating topic. I, I think, I hope people uh, find it also interesting. Please, guys, uh, check David's channel. He has not only talks about instruments, but talks about really cool, cool stuff. 
uh, ancient style like meteorites and Picassos and all. We, we have a, a, a 4.6 uh, billion year old meteorite. This, this meteorite is actually uh, older than Earth itself. So, I mean, just to think, so, so it's actually really heavy. It's about 10 pounds. Um, you know, so thinking about something like this, uh, you know, it, it really is, is amazing because my, my new channel, Talking Treasure, really talks about some of these objects that if you think this meteorite was traveling in space for 350 million years before plunging into Earth's atmosphere at, I think it was going, coming in at maybe 100,000 miles an hour down, and, you know, and, and it, it creates these big craters um, this, this actually fell in Russia in 1967. It's, it's called the Semchin meteorite. And I, I don't know if you can see it, but there are a lot of these Widmannstraden patterns and, you know, and the, the olivine crystallites. Um, and just to think something like this is, is, is available to, to go and, and see and, and, and touch. And, and it really is like talking about history of, of objects. Can you imagine how many galaxies this has been through? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it just, it just kind of, it, it's kind of mind-boggling just to even think that, that the, the journey of a meteorite that's been traveling in space for 350 million years is sitting on my desk right now, and, and, and we get to, to speak about it. And, and also, you know, it, it's, it's, again, but I think it's all of the history. It, like, even this, this Meiji period uh, samurai, you know, sometimes I get a little bit lonely and speak Japanese to it. So it's, it's uh, sometimes I say, Samurai sama o genki de ero shimasu ka. And uh, so, so it's good. I, I think it's, uh, we have a, a nice connection uh, going on. So, <laughs> but absolutely. But uh, listen, great speaking to you, Pablo, and uh, all the best. Uh, and I hope you get through this whole quarantine uh, safely and, and that we all get uh, through it very safely. But thanks so much for having me and I hope to see you next. Yeah, yeah, we'll do this again. Thank you.